there's one thing you can always count on a One Piece fan to do, it's never, ever shut up about how you personally need to read One Piece. We can't help it. It's a compulsion. This series just does something to your brain. Probably involving worms or maybe snails? Either way, it's physically impossible to read even a fraction of this manga without feeling an overwhelming urge to tell everyone you meet about it. Don't believe me? Go ahead. Try it and prove me wrong. Eh, uh -huh. almost got you there. Unfortunately, many folks just like you are getting wise to our tricks by now, and more importantly, have just made up their minds in general that this thing isn't their kind of thing. Either because the cartoony art style turns them off, or they fall off before the series really pops off. Which happens, like, only 90 chapters in, so... Pfft. I don't know what everyone's complaining about. With its truncated eight-hour retelling of the manga's literally and literarily epic prologue, plus a bunch of real-ass people in place of those potentially off-putting cartoons, Netflix's live-action adaptation had the chance to fix all that and usher a whole new wave of viewers onto the cruise. But, of course, before it could do that, it had to actually be, you know, good? Which is a big ask for Hollywood. Trust me. I would know. Yes, that man does have condoms stuck to his chest. But then, in a shocking twist, Netflix actually started showing us bits of the show, and from the real-ass ships they were building on the sets, to the pitch-perfect casting, to glowing, apparently hard-earned endorsements from Oda himself, to Foxy! Basically everything we were seeing suggested this show might actually be, like, really good. Or at least I thought so, but then... I do have them One Piece brain snails, like, real bad. Plus, full disclosure, I got my fair share of One Piece stonks. Some might even say big stonks. You might even call my excellent and informative videos about the series a form of stonks. So obviously there would be some profit in it for me if this show did turn out to be good and then lots of people liked it and the entirety of the A society we live in could finally get off the Joker's dick and pay some long overdue respect to the real Clown Prince of Crime. Can I get a buggy fan cam? Amen! Thank you. So, yeah, a little bit of bias there. Plus, all I really had to build my hype on was blatant propaganda from the same dark marketing wizards who managed to make Calflix Netbop look halfway appealing in a short little proof of concept video that turned out to have nothing to do with the actual show. Which you might recall me spending the better part of an hour being disappointed but not at all surprised about back when that happened. And the thing about that is, I also got me some very serious Cowboy Bebop stonks, which did not stop me from toughly, but fairly, taking that show's broke metaphorical ass out back when it couldn't make good on the checks its marketing department's mouth had written. I went into One Piece fully intending to give it that same painfully honest treatment. And I don't gotta tell you the show was good for it. Everyone knows at this point. The haters are silent. The One Piece is real. Can we get much higher? I think we can. Don't get me wrong. The show is really, really good. Ten times better than anyone had any right to expect. Netflix and Tomorrow Studios are a hundred times stronger than they were two years ago. But let's not overdo it here. It's not the greatest anime adaptation of all time that some people are making it out to be. That's still Speed Racer. Speed Racer is literally perfect. There's no shame in coming a close second to Speed Racer. One Piece does come pretty close, though. If the team behind this show can learn from the few mistakes they did make, which they already seem to be doing with the reshoots that Oda reportedly requested, future seasons could easily be contenders for that crown. I mean, even if it stays on its current level, it's still an adaptation fully worthy of the name, a love letter to fans of the anime and manga that simultaneously serves as an amazingly accessible introduction for folks who've never heard of either. Make no mistake, I am going to spend the vast majority of this video just absolutely slobbering all over this thing, but I will not hold back as a critic or a fan where I do think that it falters. First though, real quick, I've 
basically been writing non-stop for the entire last week to make this video as good as possible, and I just didn't have time to throw together the goofy GamerSups One Piece skit that I wanted to on top of that. So instead of that, I'm gonna give you a testimonial. These are the real waifu cups that I went through in the process of putting this video together. Uh, I drank a lot of the stuff. Currently, my favorite flavor is two parts Cajos Bloody Orange, one part caffeine-free lemonade. Shit's delicious. All of their stuff is stupid tasty, and I cannot recommend enough that you try it for yourself and maybe snag the cute new Pillow Talk or Space Punk waifu cups they have while supplies last. Uh, what else? Link in the doobly-doo. Use the promo code BASEMENT for 10% off. All right. Let's get slobbering. Maybe the most impressive thing about One Piece, the live action one that is, is that it's even remotely watchable to begin with. It is notoriously difficult to turn anime or manga into any kind of good live action thing, and that's with regular manga. One Piece is the Looney Tunes of Lord of the Ringses, an epic fantasy narrative of essentially unrivaled scope set in a world where almost anything is possible as long as it's funny, starring a main character with the combined power set of Mr. Fantastic and Bugs Bunny. I honestly don't think there's ever been a more challenging adaptation to get right. When this show was first announced, no one thought it would work. X marked the doubt for Eiichiro Oda himself when he first started writing One Piece, the comic book one, in 1997. It was only after witnessing the marvelously cartoonish martial arts action of Stephen Chow's 2001 Shaolin Soccer that he began thinking a live-action take on his work could work at all, let alone be good. Which I think shows impeccable taste on Sensei's part, since Chow's 2004 masterpiece, Kung Fu Hustle, is the exact movie that set every one of my expectations for what Dragon Ball Evolution would eventually fail to be. Imagine the world we'd be living in today if Chow had agreed to direct that movie instead of just producing it, or if the execs at Fox had actually, like, remembered why he was their first choice to begin with, or gave even the slightest shit about the film's quality. <sighs> but there's no point pining for what could have been, at least not anymore. Not now that we finally have a Hollywood jump adaptation right in front of us that properly emulates Chow's chaotic yet artfully composed fight choreography and surreally visionary wire and effects work. Let me tell you, it is every bit as beautiful as I imagined it could be. It may not be as structurally perfect as Speed Racer, but if there's one thing One Piece beats every other anime adaptation on, even Alita, it's making its fights feel like anime. Not just in the way that punches send dudes flying after an exaggerated windup, and dudes can slice entire battleships in half from the beach with a literal breeze, but the artful layering of that over-the-top action and its carefully orchestrated musical timing. You know, the precise most important thing about anime action in general and Cowboy Bebops specifically. <laughs> that Flixboy Netbop most aggravatingly failed to get right. Every shot of every fight in Netflix feels like that bit where the Sakuga hits right when the OST's busy dropping and you remember why you're still watching Naruto for the second time that episode. According to Netflix's behind the scenes stuff, it apparently took them five days days to film that fight in the courtyard with Captain Morgan and his marines, and I absolutely believe it looking at the finished product. Also, if you're not aware, when I say them, I'm talking about the stars of the show who are actually doing their own stunts here, thus enabling the series to use these long, beautiful takes where every straw hat has their own entertaining thing going on in a big, complex brawl like a ballet where mother get cut in half sometimes because the camera doesn't have to keep jumping around to keep us from noticing that Nami's been replaced by some wiry 40-something dude to 
twirl her extendo bow staff for her. Luffy may not really be made of rubber, but he's really bouncing around and vaulting over dudes to kick other dudes in the chest. Zoro is really, I mean, really swinging those katana around. Sanji's really kicking pistols out of dudes' hands while perfectly balancing a platter of food. Mihawk is really one hand no selling that at least 20 pound prop. And Usopp is really running away. I know that sounds like a glib punchline, but scrambling over rocky terrain is not an easy stunt. Good job, Jacob Gibson. <laughs> But these actors deserve praise for far more than just their stunt work. You know the precise second most important thing that Cowbop Flicks Boy surprisingly did get right? The way Mustafa Shakir absolutely embodied Jet Black and John Cho was, you know, pretty good as Spike. Everyone in this show is cast and costumed at least that well. Garp, Gold Roger, Mihawk, Chef Zeph, Shanks, Yasop, Ben Beckman, Lucky Roo, and the rest of the Red Hair crew, Kobe, Helmeppo, Axe Hand Morgan, Captain Kuro, Butchie and Sham, Alvida, every one of the Arlong Pirates, Nojiko, Belmare, Buggy, Buggy? Oh my god, Buggy! We'll get back to him. Kabaji looks like he stepped right out of the manga, and half of you just had to Google who that even is. This is the only drawing in existence of the original Mr. Seven, but yup, no doubt about it, that's a Mr. F***ing Seven right there if I've ever seen one. Or he was, anyway. You'd think the combination of such absurd anime ultraviolence with even more absurd cartoon characters would create a dissonant, clashing tone, but Oda made it work in the original manga, and through a steadfast commitment to honoring his extremely weird and unique vision at every level of production, this show makes it work too. In defiance of general Hollywood trends toward gritty cinematic realism. One Piece creates and sustains its heightened reality by embracing a very theatrical brand of absurdism. Performances from leads and bit players alike are exaggerated and expressive, falling somewhere between a Broadway musical and pay-per-view wrestling in their energy and commitment. It's the kind of acting that makes you want to buy into the fantasy because everyone involved is clearly having so much fun with it. The costumes are impressively detailed and generally well-made, feeling period authentic despite the intentional anachronism of One Piece's setting, but they're maybe a little too well-made, a little too clean, colors a little too perfectly curled. You're constantly reminded that what you're looking at are, in fact, costumes. Not that you'd ever forget it with dudes like Moji, Mary, and Captain Nezumi strutting around as their 100% manga-accurate bad selves. The sets, meanwhile, feel authentically cluttered and lived in, props artfully arranged to tell us more about the world and the characters who inhabit it, with easter eggs foreshadowing and newspaper headlines ripped straight from the wiki timeline hidden throughout. This show's production designers deserve a medal for everything they've done to bring One Piece's world to life and fully immerse us in it. But then, perhaps the arrangement's a touch too artful. The proportions of the environment a wee bit too dramatically satisfying. The distressing on the wood too noticeably, intentionally aesthetic. As with the costumes, it's impossible to forget that these are handmade sets. Not because they look cheap, or fake, but because the care and craftsmanship that's gone into them is simply too impressive to ignore. Which can still be seen as a flaw if you're coming at One Piece from the realism is king, good production design needs to be invisible mindset that decided talking Animal Hamlet the musical's remake had to look like a David Attenborough documentary, but Nobody who wants that was ever gonna like any good version of One Piece anyway. I think the aesthetic sweet spot this show finds between Hook, Muppet Treasure Island, Pirates of the Caribbean, and a little bit of Baron Munchausen is a perfect fit for the manga's world. I mean, we're talking about a universe where scary pirate ships have heart print swan themes, sometimes guys are also fish, and all the telephones are snails. And in this cinematic version of that universe, not only are all those ships real-ass ships, but those snails are real-ass Muppets. I'm sorry. I just... I never dreamed it could be so 
beautiful. Over a year ago now, when I first started pondering the possibility this show might actually be good on the second channel, I argued that Muppets aren't just the second greatest art form after anime, they're also the ideal medium for creating believable live-action fantasy critters. The obvious, glaring unreality of puppets being puppets actually helps to keep them on the safe side of the uncanny valley while paradoxically encouraging greater suspension of disbelief on the part of the audience. Just think about how much easier it is to believe that Kermit the Frog or Elmo is actually talking to a late night talk show host than any CG character they've tried to do that with. And One Piece's snails are proof positive that I was right. This summer, you will believe a man can tell a conference on a mollusk. Hashtag make Chopper a Muppet. Other critters like the News Coup and Lord of the Coast have been rendered in CGI, but the cartoony exaggerated proportions under their realistic scales and feathers, like Pokemon and Detective Pikachu, still make them feel right at home within the real fake world of props and sets and costumes. By calling so much attention to the artifice of its production, One Piece conditions the viewer to accept that stuff in this world just looks like that. So when Buggy's bits start floating a boat and Luffy goes all <laughs> Even though the effects aren't monumentally better than insert your favorite god-awful Fantastic Four movie here, and sometimes they're even worse, they fit within the cartoony hyper-reality the show's created. Kind of like how The Mask makes its 90s-ass CGI work. And later, when Mihawk is swinging around his big obviously fake sword, and all the fishmen are obviously just guys in makeup, we're primed to just roll with that too. What I will not roll with though, under any circumstances, is this production team getting snubbed for any and all eligible makeup, design, and effects awards this year. Emmy committee, this is your one warning. There will be blood, and it won't be corn syrup. Of course, it is entirely possible to get all of that tone and aesthetic stuff right and still end up making a bad show. Some of the worst sequels and adaptations out there are the ones that prize brand recognition over their own artistic ambitions. Jurassic World is an embarrassingly bad movie, only surpassed in its passion for pissing all over the original by its even worse sequels. It is full of problems. No part of it is not a problem. But if I had to pinpoint one single moment where I knew with absolute certainty that I would hate this movie for the rest of my life, it's the second the theme song drops. Jurassic Park's theme is one of the most powerful, iconic tracks that John Williams himself ever composed. The swelling melody, at once majestic and a little playful, perfectly captures Sam and Laura's indescribable wonder at the scientific miracle that is real live dinosaurs! It's a key component in one of the most breathtaking moments in cinematic history, and in the name of instant brand recognition, Jurassic World deploys that theme five minutes in to capture the majesty of a monorail and the f***ing Hilton Nublar lobby. you. Suck my balls. Thank you so much for to eating my ass. If Jurassic World was actually like a work of art inspired by the original and not, you know, a cynical product designed to cash in on our memories of it, the people making it would have at least tried to earn the feelings associated with that song and drop it like a mic like it deserves. Instead, they dropped it like a load of dishes. <laughs> Marketing for One Piece has been keen to emphasize that everyone working on the show, the cast, crew, writers, directors, even the producers, loves the source material and is working their hardest to make something Oda himself would be proud of. I mean, I believed it as soon as I saw Matt Owens talking about how important Nami's map room is to the story and Inyaki Godoy's quote about how he wants everyone and their grandma to know about One Piece. If that's not the most authentic One Piece fan dialogue conceivable, I don't know what is. But if I did hypothetically need extra convincing after all that, plus watching four straight episodes, my little Grinch heart would have no doubt swelled at least three sizes when I finally heard 
we are. This is just a perfect scene. The first time Luffy, Nami, Zoro, and Usopp hit the seas together on Going Merry is the moment they go from not a crew to truly being the Straw Hats. Luffy is officially the captain of his own ship, Usopp unofficially so, and we are officially on the cruise. I respect the choice to hold this song back until episode 4 so much. The temptation must have been nigh irresistible to drop it earlier. I mean, fans were clamoring for We Are as the title theme, demanding to hear it in episode 1 or they'd walk, and the show does quite tactically deploy Bink's brew in an episode 1 flashback to sate those folks' appetites, but it makes sure to properly savor this musical main course, and it's better for it. This also gives the series' original soundtrack, composed by Sonia Belusova and Giona Ostinelli, room to assert its own musical identity. And thankfully, that soundtrack is also amazing. Luffy's leitmotif, in particular, evokes a sense of swashbuckling whimsy and high seas adventure with enthusiastic, distinctly tropical orchestration that'd feel right at home in a Monkey Island movie. That is, when it wouldn't feel more at home in Pirates of the Caribbean. Which is pretty much the exact Venn diagram I was hoping to hear coming out of my home theater when I put this show on. I was, admittedly, not expecting the Arlong rap. Bang! You ready to fight? Bang! Welcome to Arlong Park! But I'm definitely not complaining about it. Speaking of speakers, this show's soundscape sings, the waves crashing all around you, the creaking deck in the background, the shouts and cannon blasts that punctuate the big battles. It really puts you right in the heart of the action. Though I can also attest from filming the reaction that I'm making an excuse to plug right now that it sounds great on headphones too. Unfortunately, it doesn't look even half as great on a computer as it does on a TV, and it's got to be a 4K HDR-ready TV at that. Like many Netflix shows, this is clearly just not color-graded with lower-end displays in mind. On the right screen and settings, the colors absolutely pop, especially the mood lighting at night, but in SDR, it's all washed out and dusty orange like they threw a Whiskey Peak filter over everything. Which is a real shame, because in every other respect, this is a show worth looking at. Through painterly cinematography, Karakuri clockwork stunt choreography, and a Star Warsian, no, Muppetsian eye for meaningful, authentic detail in the construction of its mise-en-scene, One Piece demands and commands the viewer's full attention at all times. Magnificent. They call this a show, but it's essentially a series of eight remarkably tight and gorgeous short films with the budget of early Wes Anderson pictures, each one bookended by its own bespoke title card variant, which are just so sick, I love the buggy one. And this progressively evolving end credit sequence that gradually fills in the East Blue Sea chart with the new islands introduced in each episode, which the app automatically skips over after five seconds so as not to get in the way of your binging. Which brings us to the other major problem with how Netflix One Piece, emphasis on the Netflix, has been presented by Netflix, the binge model. Everything about this show is designed and really deserves to be savored, but the way it's all been dumped on us all at once just doesn't leave time to properly digest it. At least, not if you want to join the conversation on time and stay ahead of spoilers. I believe One Piece is best enjoyed about two episodes at a time. It splits very cleanly into four satisfyingly self-contained feature-length chunks. And while nobody can dispute the numbers that this big content drop is currently doing for Netflix, both domestically and globally, I think the show might have garnered even more hype if they released those chunks on, like, a weekly basis. You know, give the fans some time to really get hyped about that We Are drop. Give the Netflix onlys... Wow, I can't believe I just said that unironically. A week to stew in the aftermath of Nami's betrayal before Arlong Park starts. There's just so much to talk about in this show, and... I wish we got more time to talk about it. But of course, nobody would be talking about it to begin with if One Piece's producers hadn't first accomplished one other seemingly impossible task. 
Casting the perfect Straw Hat crew. Even after he was convinced that the world and action of One Piece could conceivably be caught on film, Oda never really believed that his irrepressibly upbeat hero, Monkey D. Luffy, could truly exist in our world. But that all changed the day he met Inyaki Godoy. From the start of the soliloquy that he delivers to a disinterested news coup on his rapidly sinking starter boat, to the final gum gum axe smackdown he lays on Arlong and beyond, Inyaki lives and breathes this role. Even in the earliest scenes of the pilot, where the actors were clearly still finding their footing in the world, and Luffy occasionally sounds like he's just reciting a line rather than voicing his own thoughts. I'm not gonna kill you, all right? I just need you to be quiet. It still feels like Luffy reciting that line, not just some actor. Godoy is always effortlessly in character, even when he's not on set. All right, everybody, welcome to my ship tour. So right here we have um, the, the things and they race this thing right here. And uh, uh, this thing right here, this is called a, a quarter lift. Yeah, it's uh, it races the thing called boom. That's right, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. This is the ship, uh, this is our ship, yeah. This man was simply born to play Monkey D. Luffy. Watching some of Netflix's bonus material, it's kinda uncanny how much it feels like Luffy himself is the one walking between the overburdened desks of the Shueisha office, accepting the hat from Oda Sensei and Mayumi Tanaka, and goofing around with his crewmates backstage. Hey, we're the cast of One Piece. And amazingly, every other member of the crew fits their role just as snugly. Jacob Gibson, perfectly captures Usopp's facade of bravado, his nervous swagger, the playful, adventurous way that he enhances the truth that makes you want to play along with his fantasies. He has a subtle, natural charisma about him that makes his insistence on playing captain, even when Luffy's around, feel endearing rather than arrogant. Taz Skyler Sanji likewise walks an impressive tightrope between charming ladies man and kind of a creep, honestly, embodying the chef's salty sea dog attitude and all the hopeless, naive romanticism that still drives him underneath it. Emily Rudd shows impressive, necessary range as Nami, playing the charismatic con woman, the adventurous, sarcastic free spirit who so effortlessly fits in with the boys, and the scared, vulnerable young lady, almost but not quite broken by Arlong's cruelty with equal skill, which is vital for this first season especially. East Blue is Nami's story after all. Its emotional climax would completely fall apart if she couldn't carry it, but it also bodes well for the rest of the series. If Luffy is the heart of the Straw Hats, then Nami is the crew's lone, overworked brain cell. So Rudd really needs that range to properly bounce off of everyone around her. The stubborn pragmatism to balance Luffy's infectious zaniosity, the subtle grace to brutally and hilariously swerve every one of Sanji's unwanted advances, the calculated criminality and untreated alcoholism that makes her Zoro's kindred spirit. In particular, she has some very strong screen chemistry with Gibson's Usopp, and that is amazing news, because the weakling trio is the most entertaining and essential aspect of the whole straw hat dynamic, f you fight me, and as long as they hashtag make Tony Tony Chopper a Muppet, I think this show can really do that dynamic justice. Might even work with CGI Chopper, although I have my doubts. Their counterpart, the Monster Trio, has already been assembled by the end of this season, and it is very much working as intended. Luffy has quite authentically passionate bromances with both his loyal first mate and the ship's cook. He and Sanji are instantly ride or die after he gives the chef's experimental cooking the respect they both know it deserves. And true to the manga and anime, there is not a doubt in my mind that if this Luffy if he asked him to, this Zoro would not hesitate to suck. You don't think she like, like likes me, do you? 
You're asking the wrong guy. And of course, as they should, Sanji and Zoro hate each other from the jump because they both think only one of them can take the top spot as Luffy's one true shonen rival. Their manga relationships basically Betty and Veronica, and these actors totally get that. It's the least you can do considering I saved your ass from those fishmen. What? I saved your ass. Now, which of these two fights the goodest is a topic of endless debate in the One Piece fandom, with Oda himself refusing to confirm or deny one way or another. In live action, though, it's a lot less debatable. It is exceedingly impressive how Taz Skyler learned to kick, carry himself, and even cook like Sanji over the course of this season's production, even cooking for his castmates behind the scenes. But even in the face of all that effort, Zoro easily steals every last fight scene he's in. His fight with Sham and Butchie is the absolute peak of the whole season. As one of Japan's most prominent young actors, Makenyu has by far the most experience out of anyone in this cast in bringing anime heroes to life. He did a bang-up job as Okuyasu in the Diamond is Unbreakable movie, the best he could as Twinkie J-Rock Scar in FMA, and just this year he starred as Saint Seiya himself in, you know, that. Sonny Chiba's son is a trained martial artist with plenty of stage fighting experience who already knew his way around a katana or three before he was even cast. If Inyaki was born to play Luffy, then Makenyu's been training his whole life to become the perfect Roronoa Zoro. Well, almost perfect. He does play the role a little more edgy, alcoholic badass than cocky, alcoholic doofus, the widespread online criticism that this show made Zoro too hot is, in fact, valid and true. But hot Zoro still has the right chemistry and contrast with the rest of the cast to perfectly fill regular Zoro's boots. His hotness even kind of adds another layer to why Sanji would feel so instantly threatened by him. And it thankfully doesn't get in the way of him doing all the essential goofy Zoroisms in his own edgy way. Do you know where to find me? I didn't. Thought I was headed back to the house. The one big compromise the show does make with its characters is the way it's forced to cut down each Straw Hat's introduction to fit the runtime. Like, we barely have time to find out what each new friend's all about and what they can do before Luffy invites them onto the crew. Sanji's core value of feeding every hungry man he meets is established with Gin, but it's never really tested with the Krieg pirates, which in turn means that Luffy doesn't get the chance to really earn the cook's loyalty by saving his childhood home. And Syrup Village only gives Usopp one brief hero moment to offset all his lying and cowardice before everyone else is just like, yeah, we'll spend the rest of our lives with you. The characters do eventually prove themselves to each other over the course of the season, except Usopp, his one big hero moment happens out of eyeshot of everyone else. But before that, the main justification for everyone ending up on Going Merry kind of seems to just be like, vibes? Which feels pretty unsatisfying from a writing perspective, but the actors kind of save it. The way Inyaki plays Luffy really highlights the captain's emotional intelligence, so when everyone proves themselves after they've passed his vibe check, it kind of reads like his good character judgment has been validated. And the cast as a whole kind of just vibes with each other in a very natural feeling way. Especially in Usopp's case, a lot of the behavior that was kind of annoying in the early manga, Reads is way more endearing and playful here because of how he plays it and how everyone reacts to it. And I didn't stop until I single-handedly defeated Arlong and his deadly crew. With a little help, of course. Three cheers for Captain Usopp! We couldn't have done it without him! This isn't just a testament to the skills of the actors, though. It is equally impressive how much of these characters the writers were able to preserve as they whittled the story around them down to essentially five minutes a chapter. When he finally got the chance to meet Eiichiro Oda, showrunner Matt Owens told him, quote, 
One Piece is really a story about how everyone has tragedy, pain, sadness in their life, but it's not what defines you. What defines you is how you use that to motivate your future, and no one has to do it alone. When you find those people around you who motivate you, lift you up, and help you, that is the greatest power in this world. And that is the story I want to put out into the world. In response to that, Oda simply said, I have 100% faith in you. The One Piece fandom's faith proved a little harder to earn. Responses to the writing in the first teaser for the series ranged from skeptical to outright hostile, with a particular style of writing drawing a lot of ire. I'm sensing a little bit of tension amongst the crew. Not, Not a, a crew. crew. All great fighters call out their finishing moves. No, they don't. Whedonisms, MCU writing, whatever you want to call it, characters making snarky, smirking, self-aware comments on the ridiculousness of whatever ridiculous situation they've found themselves in can be found pretty much everywhere in modern American television, movies, and even games. A formulaic shortcut to comedy and relatability that's often taken at the unwitting cost of undercutting the audience's ability to take those stories seriously and buy into their fiction at all. If the characters don't give a f about what's happening or even believe the world they're in is real, why should we? In the worst case, it can make the audience feel bad about having fun with the silly fun stuff the characters are making fun of. And even in the best case, if you overdo it, it can often make all the characters in a story come off as less relatable than, like, vaguely psychotic? Which can be a fun dynamic. Community is a top-tier TV show, but that's probably not the tone that you want to see in One Piece. Thankfully, the fandom's worries about those lines proved to be unfounded. I am happy to report that the Straw Hat crew is every bit as sincere and happy to be here as they all ought to be. What little edgy snark there is in the script comes mostly from either Zoro, who is essentially the party's reformed murder hobo, so the vaguely psychotic thing kind of works for him, and Nami, who is, at this point, trying to emotionally distance herself from these new friends she doesn't think she deserves and the adventure that they're going on. Her snark reads more as a defense mechanism, and that gives the show some serious emotional oomph when she finally drops it, opens up, and asks Luffy for help. It also helps a lot that, as the series goes on, we see time and again that Zoro's hot take on finishing moves is deeply unpopular, as it should be in the One Piece universe. Jump, jump! Get it! Special attack! Exploding star! What's that? Mouton shot. Oh, great fighters call out their finishing moves. Yeah, you're gonna fit in just fine. I mean, he's not completely alone in it either. <laughs> Though it may also be that Mihawk simply didn't think that situation merited that kind of deadly force. The writing's definitely not perfect. The show does have an unfortunate, though thankfully not too persistent, habit of blunting perfectly good punchlines with unnecessary quippy padding. Don't worry, I'm stealthy. Super stealthy. Even there, you could argue that filler comment is in character for the very nervous Kobe. And any annoyance that stuff does cause is likewise blunted by how perfectly good, great even, most of the punchlines are. If there's one thing a One Piece adaptation's writing needs to get right, before it's epic, adventurous, or action-packed, it needs to be funny. And this script is often uproariously so. Not just with clever dialogue and well-timed explosions, either. Some of the visual gags, like Helmeppo posing with Zoro's sword, had me howling. Amazing camera work in that scene. And right before that well-timed explosion, the bit where Kobe's all like, "Ah oh, man, I should have stayed with Alvita, while he's looking directly at her entire crew, burning to death, like right there, hysterical. The pair of them are even funnier together. You know something. Gop is Luffy's grandfather. Should have known from the way they both love meat. 
considered, they're probably the best part of the biggest change this show makes to East Blue. A whole new B-plot about Garp chasing down his grandson with the Marine recruits in tow. Uh, okay, not entirely new. Technically, it's based very loosely on one of the manga's cover stories, which, if you're a Netflix only, wow, that just... It still just does not sound right to say. Oda draws these cute little wordless bonus stories on the cover of each chapter about what various characters have gotten up to since the Straw Hats left, many of which turn out to be crazy plot important years after the fact. The best one in East Blue is about Buggy trying to make his way back to his crew after Luffy sends him flying, all the while dealing with the humiliating handicap of being just an adorable little guy. Unfortunately, the show wasn't able to adapt that one, but the framing of Buggy's side plot does still leave a time window open for his whole mini-adventure to have happened off-screen, which is generally how the show approaches any of the cuts that it does have to make for time. Wherever it changes or simplifies a character, it keeps them consistent with the manga, so if you only watch the live action, you still understand them, but if you read the source material, you understand them a lot better. Sadly, Monkey D. Garp is the exception that proves that rule. Vincent Reagan definitely gets the look and voice of the character right, but his personality in the manga is a lot more cheerful, and he's definitely not the type of dude to stomp on someone else's dreams, especially not Luffy's, not even as a test. Which kind of feels like a huge cop-out as an explanation for his behavior this season, and it might have been exactly that. Like, maybe Garp just doesn't want to admit that Kobe, with a little help from Mihawk and his whole speech about leaving the world for the next generation to take over, changed his mind about letting Luffy go. I mean, if they did run with that, that could actually be like a good plot justification for Garp's character developing to be more in line with who he is in the manga. But in this season... Uh, yeah, his part of the story is super awkward and out of character and ends with a real wet fart of a fight that steals precious screen time from the brawl with Arlong and I just, I just wish it didn't happen. But other parts of that whole Marine subplot, specifically the Kobe and Halmepo parts, do really work. In particular, I'm about to blaspheme a little here, but... I think that having Kobe be the one to give Luffy his first wanted poster is better than how the manga handles that moment and ties a beautiful little bow not just on their friendship but the whole East Blue journey. Plus the Marine subplot does allow the series to front load a whole bunch of world building from later in the manga that, you know, realistically, Knowing Netflix, probably good that they're getting that done early. On the subject of world building though, Garp's weird portrayal here does have other negative effects on it indirectly when he asks Dracul Mihawk to hunt Luffy down for him. This does make sense as a justification for the warlord being at Baratier for Zoro's big moment without needing to get the Krieg pirates involved, who've been replaced in this version by Orlong's crew so the show has more time to beautifully handle Nami's big emotional arc and do more of the big cool fight that follows it in Arlong Park proper, which was probably the right call to make, all things considered. Creek Pirates are kind of boring. Again, here comes the blasphemy. I kind of like that part of the manga less than how the show uses Krieg as an unusually memorable and funny jobber in Mihawk's intro scene. Which you gotta admit, is one of the hardest, most anime things that has ever been filmed. Who's the quarry? And that scene mostly does Mihawk's manga world-building job of skyrocketing our power expectations for the rest of the series and establishing the seven warlords as scary motherfuckers. But in the manga, it was the fact that a motherfucker that scary just showed up out of the blue to ruin everyone's day for no reason in particular that made One Piece's world suddenly feel so much Huger. And by the same token, having Mihawk show up looking for Luffy specifically makes the show's world feel way smaller. Like, insert your favorite Arrowverse series here, where the world only really seems to exist when the protagonist or a villain is looking directly at it. In the grand scheme of the Grand Line, the Straw Hats should be just another rookie pirate crew, at least until they prove themselves in Alabasta. And even when baddies do start coming for the bounty or other beefs, it's mostly small-time crooks like Foxy. Oh no, boss! 
I didn't mean that. You're big time. The biggest. Now, I'm willing to give One Piece's writers a pass on this for at least getting the rest of Mihawk so right. But next season, if the next Warlord's response to Luffy saying, So I'm gonna kick your ass, is anything other than, I don't even know who you are. We are gonna have beef. Unless they also decide to confirm the other, even crazier crocodile fan theory, then I might be cool with it. What I'm not cool with, though, is how Arlong also comes after Luffy, personally, at Baratier one episode later. Although I do like how he uses Buggy's severed head as a tracking device to get there. I'll take pretty much any excuse to give Jeff Ward more screen time. The problem with this excuse, though, is it kind of completely undermines the season's big bad. Arlong is a big fish from the Grand Line, biding his time in this very small pond as he plots literal world domination. For him to go this far out of his way, even to collect tribute from some 15 million very nobody on the other side of East Nowhere, makes him seem less ambitious, less intimidating, and weaker as a villain overall. To then let himself be distracted from that distraction by the mere mention of some genetically inferior human kid who doesn't even have a wanted poster is kind of just pathetic. Arlong should be too busy pursuing his own dreams to care. Now, Luffy does have the map to the Grand Line that's the season's big MacGuffin, which Arlong technically does need for the sake of his dream, but like, he could get one of those from any marine base, right? And Captain Nezumi's already in his pocket, so... <sighs> Still, early Arlong is kind of essential to the season's whole speedrun strat, and giving Buggy more screen time is just good business sense, so even if I did have magic time powers that let me fix Netflix shows, I think I'd only change like maybe two things about this plotline. Firstly, I'd have Kurobi and Chu be the ones to put the screws to Buggy by themselves in episode three. Not only would delegating like that make Arlong seem more distant and dangerous as a villain, but it would give the goons a bit of time to be built up as their own characters, and heck, it might even make enough room in the season for best boy Hachi to be written back in. Okay, I know they definitely cut him because his arms would have been way too prohibitively expensive to animate, but if I was in charge, I would have simply made half the show's budget the Hachi budget, which is probably why I don't get to decide how $100 million plus streaming series are plotted out. But if I did, the second thing I'd do is have Buggy escape from those fish goons and chase Luffy down on his own. If he gave Arlong's best guys the slip, that would give their boss at least a flimsy reason to show up at Baratier, which is also way less of a trip for him than going all the way to Orangetown for some clown. And from there, he could, you know, give his big fish man supremacy speech, attack the restaurant, get in a fight with the straw hats that scares Nami into going back, all that good stuff that happens in the show. Except that Buggy would also at least briefly be involved in the fight long enough to get his body stolen so that he could then be an annoying talking head for the next couple episodes and flip everyone off and leave the second he gets his body back. I just love that whole bit, even if his last one-liner is kind of boring. I'd love to make things right, but it's time to exit stage left. Generally, on the rare occasions where the show does change something for the worse, it also adds something fun and new and authentically One Piece like bodiless buggy to balance that out. For example, it kind of makes no sense now how Captain Kuro of the Thousand Plans' big plan to turn Kaya's house into a locked room and then murder her inside it would have realistically resulted in the suspicion-free life of inherited wealth and luxury that is his ultimate goal as a villain. For plausible deniability's sake, an accident in the middle of a full-blown pirate invasion is clearly the much smarter way to go. But Full-blown pirate invasions are very expensive to film, and Kaya's mansion does make a beautifully One Piece feeling backdrop for some absolutely breathtaking swashbuckling. The show also kind of needs the runtime that it saves by scaling the big battle down to flesh out her and Usopp's relationship, which ends up being time very well spent. Nice pull, bro. And you know, even if the whole slasher movie bit doesn't fully make sense for Kuro's calculating character, it absolutely makes sense for his character design. The shot where he sneaks up on Mary in the wine cellar and just guts him shivers every time. In spite of how it diminishes his complexity and cunning as a villain, this change doesn't take one iota away from Kuro's cool factor. In some ways, it even enhances it, though not quite as much as the other 
brilliant tweaks that One Piece makes to Binky, Boogie, Burpee, Buggy, Buggy the Clown, Buggy the Genius Jester. Wow. I bet everyone in the East Blue knows who you are. <gasps> no! In the manga, Buggy's introduction was menacing, memorable, over the top, and basically impossible to film on anything less than a feature budget. I mean, his pirates turn a whole ass town into their playground of destruction. He personally blasts an entire block of buildings away by himself on camera, and on top of all the sets and effects it requires, they'd need an actual trained lion to do one of the fights justice. Where, oh where, was the dancing lion? So yeah, it's totally understandable that they'd need to rework the arc, but the way they reworked it is actually genius. The show moves the fight mostly inside to a moodily lit circus tent, which I don't have to tell you is a perfect fit for Buggy's whole brand, with only brief exterior shots to demonstrate the devastation of Orange Town. But that one shot is all it takes to start us thinking on why these citizens are so nervously compliant and clapping and laughing along with the show Buggy and his freaks are putting on for the Straw Hats. The terrified, twisted smiles that we see in the captive crowd as they're forced to cheer on their tormentors imply all these horrifically violent things that are so much worse to imagine than any special effect. Buggy is straight up scarier here than he ever was in the manga, and that is really impressive. That said, even this change has its downsides. By neglecting to properly demonstrate the true terrifying power of a buggy ball, One Piece's writers have effectively kneecapped their ability to deliver the funniest punchline in manga history five or so seasons from now. But worry not, One Piece showrunners who are definitely watching this, you still have plenty of time to incorporate a buggy ball into the big log town brawl at the start of season two. Especially what with the very cool and historic historically important strike that you were quite possibly in the middle of when you dropped everything to watch this video the second it appeared in your feeds. Jeff Ward's performance as Buggy is an absolute showstopper after all. He teeters with perfectly calculated balance on the edge of a very self-aware, self-conscious brand of madness, playing up the whole crazy clown bit that's kind of been forced on him by his very unfortunate facial growth with the desperate energy of a used car salesman and the violent passion of a self-proclaimed visionary. It's pretty obvious that you writers worked him into Arlong's plotline solely as an excuse to give that performance more time to shine, and I don't blame you at all. So I think we're all on the same page that it would be a massive shame if Jeff Ward never got to make that face. And when I say that, I'm also talking to the cancel-happy Netflix execs who no doubt just shook their spouses awake to tell them about the new Jeff Thu video. The One Piece fan base wasn't expecting much from this show. We never really thought it was something we'd need or even want. But now that we do have it, and to our great surprise, like it quite a bit, if you take this away from us, we are going to become the Joker, and it'll be your fault for failing to provide a society with the objectively superior killer clown role model. Now, is the show actually worth burning a city down over? Eh, that's subjective. I would, but... I'm from Vancouver. Rioting's the only sport we're good at. One Piece is my favorite piece of live-action TV in years, though. And while I haven't seen Succession yet, unless that show's got Muppets I ain't heard about, it's probably not going to change that. If you put a gun to my head and said, slap a number on this show now, I'd give it like a high 8, maybe a low 9 out of 10. It's definitely not perfect, but it definitely is One Piece. Very very One Piece. Sometimes it's even more One Piece than One Piece. As a classic swashbuckling adventure enthusiast, a scholar of anime and manga adaptations, and a brain snail victim looking for more efficient ways to turn my friends and loved ones, One Piece is everything I hoped it could be, and more than I dared dream possible. It's a work brimming with raw creative passion and love for a thing that I also happen to love, and I'm officially on board for this hype cruise straight to the bittersweet end. Or until executive meddling ruins it and I sign up for the Juggalos. Whichever comes first. I'm Jeff Thu, possible future clown criminal, politely asking you to uh, not 
tell Clown Minority Report about that thing I just said. They're kind of like regular Minority Report, only, you know, more Tom Cruise. <laughs>